Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. Today's video is going to be part two of talking about evangelical slash inspirational romance. If you missed part one, I will link that video up above. And overall, this is part of a series of videos that I'm putting together, exploring different aspects of deconstructing from evangelical Christianity through integrated book reviews where I use specific texts to help guide the conversation. Again, if you missed part one of discussing evangelical evangelical romances, I'm going to recommend you go there first and watch that. That's going to give you a lot of information about what evangelical romance is, the history of evangelical romance, race-based differences in readers of evangelical romance, and kind of set you up for what we're going to be doing in today's video. As I mentioned in part one, the primary text that I'm drawing on for this discussion is Romance and God, Evangelical Women and Inspirational Fiction by Lynn S. Neal. This is an academic text. It is an ethnography of evangelical women readers of inspirational slash evangelical romance. It was written in 2006, so this is primarily looking at the time period of the 1990s and the early 2000s, which dovetails nicely with me discussing my own experiences since I came of age in the late 90s and early aughts and was reading these kinds of romances throughout that period. Part one was really about laying the groundwork and creating framework for what we're going to be talking about in this video, so I do recommend that you check that out if you haven't before. That part is a little bit more theoretical, a little bit more academic, and we're going to get more concrete in this installment. The topics for part two are going to be discussing this concept of the sacred romance and the way that that can contribute to toxic ideas about gender, sexuality, and relationships. We're also going to be looking at five different popular books as case studies for some of the things I've talked about in part one and in this video, some of the problems that I see in this subgenre. And again, I do want to reiterate, I am not a current reader of this subgenre with a few exceptions. So the scope of what I'm talking about in this video primarily applies to Christian romances that were published in the 1990s and early 2000s. I can't speak much to what is getting published now in the genre, although I do have a couple of brief things that I'm going to say towards the end of this video with regards to that, but in general the issues that I see and the issues I'm talking about are based on the reading that I did during that time period. It's possible that some of these things have improved. I don't know whether or not that's the case, um, but I, I think that it's important to look at some of the issues that existed within this subgenre during the time that I was reading them in very formative years. The books we're going to be looking at for case studies are the Christy Miller series by Robin Jones Gunn, The Princess by Lori Wick, Redeeming Love by Francine Rivers, Silk by Linda Chaikin, and lastly, The Hawk and the Jewel by Lori Wick. And all of these are going to be used in different segments of the video to demonstrate some of the issues that I see. Finally, alongside those last two case studies, we're going to be talking about the ways that some of these novels have been used to prop up colonizer narratives, paternalism, and white supremacy, all of which are continuing problems within evangelical Christianity. For more on that, I would recommend that you check out the first video in this deconstruction series where I talk about toxic patriarchy and the history of evangelical Christianity in America, primarily through the lenses of Jesus and John Wayne and the making of biblical womanhood. Those were the two texts that I primarily used for that video. That is what we're going to try to accomplish in this video, and I want to start by talking about the Christy Miller series by Robin Jones Gunn. <laughs> I mentioned in part one that most of these books were not necessarily written for teenagers. Most of them were written with adult women in mind, although plenty of teenagers did read them, myself included. Now the Christy Miller series is an exception. It's one of the few popular Christian romance series that was actually directed at teenagers. And it is mentioned in Romance and God because the author actually interviewed the author Robin Jones Gunn, and it's interesting to hear about her thinking for the series, her inspiration for it and her goals for it. This was a series that I read. I also read the spin-off series, the Sierra Jensen series, and these were quite popular among the young women that I knew. Gunn really saw this as part of her calling into ministry, and like I mentioned in part one, the thing that's interesting about this subgenre is that while in many evangelical churches women did not have formal access to preaching and teaching at the pulpit because of their ideas about gender roles, this isn't true in 
in all evangelical churches, but certainly in a lot of them, becoming an author of these romances ended up being their way into speaking to women about theology and their ideas about God and faith and religion. And Robin Jones Gunn was a great example of this. She viewed this as an opportunity for ministry. Gunn was a youth group leader and in the book it says, on a camp out with a youth group, Gunn realized that the teenage girls were in their tents reading secular romance novels. Concerned by this, she went out and bought them Jeanette Oakey and Carol Gift Page novels. However, the supply did not keep up with the reading demand of her teenagers. They said, why don't you write a book? You write children's books. It'll be easy. We'll tell you what to write. They became her focus group and her critics, and the resulting novel Summer Promise started Gunn's Christy Miller series. The books in this series have sold over 1.5 million copies around the world and have been translated into to three languages. And again, this was in 2006. It's probably even more now. In fact, I was recently looking and these books have gotten cover redesigns and been reissued. And Gunn talked about the letters that she would receive from all over the world from readers and said, what astounds me continually is that we are going to meet these young hearts in heaven because of a novel, because of a romance, because of a fiction story, a character they related to, and the gospel made clear to them. So this is Gunn saying that her goal in this was really evangelism. Her her goal was conversion for the teen girls that she was writing for, and she was seeing success with that. Gunn quoted C.S. Lewis and said that this quote from him spoke to her, saying, any amount of theology can now be smuggled into people's minds under the cover of romance without their knowing it. She goes on to say, that's what I want to do as I write, smuggle the truth in under cover of romance. Gunn emphasized her surprise that God would use her, as well as a romance novel, to convert people. Her amazement highlights the religious utility of evangelical romance novels and, perhaps, silences some critics. She also hopes, it seems, that some unsuspecting readers, non-Christians, will be surprised and transformed when they pick up a romance novel that they do not know contains a Christian message. These books follow a teen girl named Christy who is torn between two boys in her life that she has crushes on. They're very high angst, very melodramatic, and have a lot of spiritual stuff put into them. I have not reread these in many years, so a lot of this is based on what has continued to stick with me and taking a look at some more recent reviews on Goodreads because it's been a minute. I've much more recently reread all of the other books that we're going to be talking about in this video, but this is one that I haven't revisited, so just kind of want to throw that out there. The big thing here is that when the books begin, Christy isn't allowed to date, and so even though she has these crushes on these boys, she's got to like figure out what to do when she can't date them. And I think I never read them, but there are even spinoff series following them in college and after they get married, her and the boy she ends up with at the end. But the big takeaway that myself and a lot of my contemporaries took from this series was that Christy would not kiss until she got married. That was like a big deal. And it was kind of viewed as this like, oh, well, don't just save yourself in terms of having sex for marriage, but you should even save your kisses for marriage. And we actually see on page the, you know, like romantic conclusion where finally she and this boy get married and she has her first kiss. And that was very heavily romanticized. And there was a lot of conversation among the people that I was with about like, oh, well, like how far is too far? Maybe like we shouldn't even be kissing anybody. And and that alongside things with purity culture, which I'm not going to get too much into in this video, just because I'm going to be diving more fully into it in a later installment in the series where I'm going to be reading and discussing books that are on and about purity culture. But that kind of an idea that the ideal, best, most holy choice that you can make as a young woman is to not even kiss anybody until you get married. It's a lot. Number one, now I really don't think it's very healthy, but it also puts so much pressure on you. And to get a little bit personal, I was the kind of person who took all of these things so seriously and really internalized them. I, I, I know this is probably like classic oldest sibling in a family thing, but I felt a lot of pressure to perform in terms of academics, in terms of morality, in terms of being a good example for my younger siblings. And because of that, I internalized these messages about purity and waiting to even kiss anybody until you're married and stuff pretty intensely. 
to the point that I was like 22 before I kissed anybody. And not because I didn't have the opportunity to, but because I was convinced that like, this was what God wanted from me. And it, I regret that because when it did finally happen, it wasn't because I chose it. And I, I, I just think it gave me a lot of hangups that took me a long time to work through. And I know I'm not alone. Again, we're going to get more into this when we talk about purity culture, but it creates a lot of problems because it's either there are people like me who are like, okay, I have to follow the letter of the law and stick really closely to what I'm supposed to be doing. And that creates problems for you. Or there are people who don't follow it, people who do like kiss or have sex with people or whatever, which is not that uncommon, and then feel awful and guilty and dirty about it and end up with this really unhealthy relationship with their own sexuality. I mean, either way you go, you have an unhealthy relationship with your sexuality. And I don't know why, again, I'm going to talk more about this in the purity culture video, but like, I don't know why we talk about it as if if you wait until you're married, everything is just going to suddenly be amazing and you'll have no hangups. Like, I just, there's so many problems that go along with this. And so for me, the Christy Miller series really heavily internalized that message of like, you are not as good as you could be, as godly as you could be. You're not pleasing God if you're kissing somebody. Like, yeah, you could do it, but it's, it's kind of like, mm, yeah, you know, I, I guess that's okay, but I wish you'd be better. Like, that's, that's, that's how it felt to me, like this disappointment, right? And it, I mean, that's fine. That's it's effed up. Like, let's be real. It's kind of effed up. So, so if you couldn't tell already, this video is going to be much more personal. Part one was much more academic. It was much more laying the groundwork for this, but we are going to get personal in these videos. And I think it's important to talk about some of this because we don't talk about it enough. And there are so many people who are still unpacking and dealing with the trauma from all of the stuff that they grew up in. And I really hope that sharing some of my own experiences can help. All right, I wanna move towards talking about this idea of the sacred romance. And we're gonna talk about two different books in context of this. But to start, let's talk about another book. This book is The Princess by Lori Wick. It's a huge bestseller. It even has special fancy edition hardcovers that came out a few years ago. Like this was a wildly successful book and I loved it. I remember this being one of my favorite books as a teenager. I reread it multiple times. I internalized a lot of this messaging about idealized femininity. See part one for more on that concept of what the ideal Christian femininity is framed as in these kinds of books and how different it often is from actual literal biblical womanhood. If you look at the biblical text and the women who are, you know, are heroines, people like Jael and Rahab, for instance. So I talk a little bit more about that in part one. But the princess, I think, is the epitome of the quiet, sweet, submissive, idealized femininity, Christian womanhood, okay? This and the other books that we're going to be talking about in this video were among my favorites, ones I reread, and ones that a few years ago I revisited for a vlog project. I will link that video up above if you're interested in seeing it. Excuse any quality issues, it is from several years ago, but I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to go back and try reading now as an adult these books that I loved as a teenager and see how it goes and vlog the experience and it did not go well. I was like, wow, these books are like really messed up and not giving great messaging to teen girls who were reading them. So what is the story of The Princess? The Princess is a contemporary romance set in a kind of made up kingdom where the king in waiting has to get married before a certain age in order to be eligible to take the throne. He had gotten married at like 18 or something to the love of his life who passed away. So he is now a widower and he needs a wife, but he's still grieving the loss of his first wife. So he lets his parents put together an arranged marriage for him. And the girl that they pick is the heroine of the princess, and she is just like the sweetest, nicest, 
most submissive little thing who, you know, like volunteers at the hospital and is like really nice to her parents and takes care of people and stuff. And so the king and queen come to her and ask if she would be willing to do this without even meeting the prince, right? Like he, he, he this is like sight unseen. And she prays about it and decides to go ahead with it. And so the first time that they even see each other is at their wedding ceremony. <laughs> okay. Um, but he never even like removes her heavy veil. So when he sees her in the palace kitchen, like days later, he doesn't recognize his wife. It's like, it, it's wild. Anyway, so this whole thing is about her just like patiently enduring until he's ready to heal and be close to her. And the thing is that the way that this deals with sex and sexuality is so weird. Again, check out the vlog that I did if you want to hear details where I actually like read what happens. But the way they handle it is very strange. The way that they talk about sexuality is this thing that you see a lot in purity culture, honestly, where it's men who are the sexual ones, men who are driven to desire sex, and women who just purely want like the emotional engagement and fulfillment. And while there are some people, men and women, who are more that way, some people who might fall on the asexual spectrum, for instance, might be that way, in, it is not the case that all women just desire this emotional bond that just isn't true. And the way that it frames it as like super romantic is weird. And then the way that when their relationship finally does become physical, it goes from like zero to 60, like they haven't even kissed each other and then they're sleeping together off page, of course, because it's a Christian romance novel. It's weird. <laughs> it's very, it's very weird. But like, I, you know, in hindsight, I'm like, why did I love this as much as I did? But I did. I thought it was so romantic. And part of it, I think, is what I'm going to talk about with this concept of sacred romance is that because in many ways, one of the characters in a Christian romance, often the hero, but sometimes the heroine, is that they are meant to almost be stand-ins for Jesus, right? This patient, long-suffering, sacrificial love. And that's the thing is that in evangelical Christianity with these ideas of like male headship in a marriage, it suggests that the husband is supposed to play this role that is parallel to Christ, that is parallel to Jesus. And so then what you get in books and teachings that are directed at young women is the romanticizing of love that mirrors Jesus, that if Jesus is the most perfect example of love, it is a love of suffering, of patiently, quietly enduring pain and suffering. And the problem is that when you link that concept so tightly with real life romantic relationships in the way that evangelical romance is, and just in general, a lot of the kinds of evangelical theology directed at women does, it creates the kind of space where abuse can thrive. And this makes a lot of sense, right? That if you are called to be like Christ, and the ultimate expression of love is patiently, quietly enduring pain and suffering and believing that that is going to change the other person. You see why there are so many women who end up staying in abusive relationships and go back to abusive relationships when they reach out to certain kinds of churches for help. This is why. This is also why young women, teenagers like myself, who would get into these romantic relationships with young men would put up with abusive behavior because they believed that their job was to be like Jesus. But then the flip side of it is that when you have these romances where the hero is like Jesus, it sets up this expectation that a, a real life human person can't meet, that your spouse is supposed to be Jesus to you. And they just can never be that. I want to read a few things from Romancing God. A widow, Jocelyn, viewed romance as part of God's plan and found hope through reading evangelical romance. There's a part of me, she confided, when I read these books that says that's the type of relationship I want right there. Madeline, Mindy, and other single readers, like the heroines of the novels, all expressed their reliance on God's timing in their romantic lives. 
The novels reassure readers about God's plan, that when they least expected it, God was preparing a way. Guided by God and a good novel, these single women felt confident of finding a Christian romance. Some married readers, like Victoria, confirmed this as they saw their marriages as evidence of God's involvement. Quote, God has sent me a wonderful husband. Talking about redeeming love, which is the next book that we're going to look at, a woman named Tamara describes the novel by explaining, like the novel does, how heterosexual love mirrors divine love. A lot of people don't realize that God is not against romance. In fact, I know that God created sex. I know he did, and he wants us to enjoy it, but within a loving relationship. And the way the father woos us is romantic. Before I got engaged to my husband, he was my first love, the Lord, and he still is my first love. That is who I spent most of my time sitting there with saying, I love you, I love you. Even though I still do that, then I have my husband I have to tell too. The love of the father is romantic. Interweaving strands of heterosexual and divine love, Tamara's romance with God remains primary. For her, evangelical romances reveal this love in a powerful way that elicits tears and provides certainty. And this is an interesting thing that reading Romance and God had me reflecting on, is the way that a relationship with God is talked about as romantic. And I'm not sure if this is as true for men in evangelical Christianity. Like, I'm not sure it's talked about that way for them as much, but certainly for women it is. And certainly my own experiences looking back at my feelings about God when I was a teenager and in my early 20s was this kind of romantic feeling of closeness, this hyper-personal God who is very close to you, who cares about every detail of your life, who, you know, I mean, like people joke about it, but like cares whether you got the parking spot you wanted. And people laugh at this because, you know, rightly, it does raise problems if you have this hyper individualistic idea of God. What does that mean when you take a step back and look at people who don't fall within the bubble of privilege that you do, like that many of the people who have that kind of feeling about God, not all, but like many come from very privileged backgrounds where they can say, well, it all works together for good. God won't give you more than you can handle. And like, is that true though? I, I like the more I see of the world, the harder it is for me to buy that. Neil goes on to talk about this divine romance. She says, Amidst the ups and downs of everyday life, whether caused by disappointing husbands or eroding beliefs, the romantic vision of God offers the possibility of an intimate relationship that will not disappoint. Through these novels, authors and readers define their relationships with God in terms of romance. In plots about love, authors demonstrate how a heterosexual relationship between a man and a woman depends upon a prior and continuing relationship with a personal God. To convey this vision, authors emphasize God's desire for a relationship with humanity, the way he romances humanity through his presence, guidance, and most especially, his unconditional love. One woman in an interview said, If we treat romance appropriately, we are able to enjoy what God gave us. I think that is the Father's heart for us. It's about Christ and the church. The picture God gave us for his love for us is marriage. Gwen took the similarity a little further, claiming that heterosexual love was, quote, just the same as our relationship with God. And Dana compared the growth of her relationship with God to the growth of a heterosexual relationship. In her view, the two relationships go through similar phases, infatuation, getting to know one another, spending time together, and growing in love for each other. Reading the novels heightened readers' sense of God's presence and love amidst the busyness and forgetfulness of their lives. And in one interview that I found really interesting, she talks to a 15 going on 16 year old who was reading some of these books, who was doing exactly this, idealizing these romances as a vision not only of her relationship with God, but of what she wanted out of a future romantic relationship. It says, for soon to be 16 year old Glenda, that kind of relationship with God was one of her dreams. After reading Sherry McDonald's Diamonds and Stardust, she wrote, wow, can it really ever be that way? That's my biggest dream. Next to that, I want to be so passionate about God that all else pales in comparison. As these women expressed their desire for intimacy with God and implied their distance from that ideal, they cited evangelical romance as a way to reestablish God's imminence and intimacy. In portrayals of romantic relationships from an evangelical perspective, these women learned and relearned the lesson of God's unfailing love, his romance with humanity. Not surprisingly, authors answered the question, what's Christian about the concept of romance in similar ways? Lori Wick stated, I think he's a very romantic God. 
Sherry MacDonald answered, God is the greatest romancer of them all. And Robin Jones Gunn emphatically declared, God is the relentless lover, and we are his first love, and he wants us back. He's not going to give up on us. He pursues us. And indeed, we see that kind of pursuit in our third case study, Redeeming Love by Francine Rivers. So what's interesting about this one is we actually just got a film adaptation of it. I have not yet seen it, although I'm a little bit curious to see what it does with the source material, but I did reread Redeeming Love a few years back for that video project I talked about earlier. For those who aren't familiar with it, Redeeming Love is a fictionalization of the book of Hosea in the Bible, but set in the gold rush era of California. So it follows this woman who had been the victim of child sex abuse and sex trafficking and is currently as a woman a victim of sex trafficking working as a prostitute, pretty much against her will. And the hero is a man named Michael Hosea who hears God tell him that she is the woman he's supposed to marry. He's this very Jesus-like figure. He's kind of perfect pure, kind, sweet, and so he pays money so that he can go and spend time with her but just talks to her and tries to convince her to marry him. She says no and repeatedly says no and he keeps going back and back and back and back until finally one day she says yes because she's almost been beaten to death and it's the only way she can survive and that is how he gains her consent to marry him and go away with him. Yeah. But it gets worse because she runs away and is sexually assaulted by his brother-in-law because he is of course a widower and the brother-in-law from his first wife doesn't like that he's married this woman and so when she runs away he sexually assaults her and does does he get come up and for it no of course not he ends up getting to marry this sweet virginal christian young girl so that's great there are a lot of issues with it not least among them the way that they talk about sex work and sex workers i don't think it's handled well at all and also, reading about her trauma is a lot. Like, there's a lot of stuff about her as a child. It's, it's, it's intense to read. But the big thing about this is that he's a fictional character mirroring this idea that you have in evangelical Christianity of this God who won't give up on you. He'll keep pursuing you, keep coming after you. But here's the problem. In a romantic relationship, that's abusive. That's possessive. That is stalking behavior, right? Like, that's a giant red flag. But it's normalized through these ideas of sacred romance and this close connection of the idealized Christian romance with a person mirroring your romantic relationship with God. And Again, this is the kind of thing that really opens the door for abusive practices and for normalizing predatory controlling behavior. Now you might be watching this and think, a romantic relationship with God? That seems kind of weird. And also, is that even true? So I want to talk a little bit about evangelical worship songs, okay? Because not all of them, but there are many popular songs and have been for years that sound like a love song that are very romantic and i have to say they were among my favorites and i certainly felt some type of way about them that was more romantic so i'm going to give you some examples and we're going to we're going to go into the past so we're going to take you all the way back to 1995 for this first song and then we'll move our way forward in time. But in 1995, Andy Park with Vineyard Publishing wrote In the Secret in the Quiet Place. Now this has been remade by several other artists since then, but originally he wrote it in 1995. And I'm gonna read you some of the lyrics. In the secret in the quiet place, in the stillness, you are there. In the secret in the quiet hour, I wait only for you, cause I want to know you more. I wanna know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to know you more. I mean, if that's not a love song, I don't know what is. Then in 2002, Chris Tomlin wrote the song Enough. All of you is more than enough for all of me, for every thirst and every need. 
you satisfy me with your love. And all I have in you is more than enough. You're my supply, my breath of life. And still more awesome than I know. You're my reward, worth living for, still more awesome than I know. And all of you is more than enough for all of me. Um, again, we have like these, these very passionate, like intensely passionate, all-consuming love kind of worship songs, right? In 2004, Tim Hughes wrote the song Beautiful One, which was eventually sung by Jeremy Camp. Here are some of those lyrics. Beautiful one, I love. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul must sing. You opened my eyes to your wonders anew. You captured my heart with this love because nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. In 2005, John Mark McMillan wrote the original version of How He Loves. This was eventually adapted by the David Crowder band where they changed a key lyric that we're gonna talk about, which I just think is really funny. I knew this from the original song where a lyric said sloppy wet kiss and it was changed to unforeseen kiss in 2009. So, uh, you know, if you know, you know. But here are the original lyrics to that song. He is jealous for me, loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions, eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us, how he loves us. And then later it says, heaven meets earth like a, it's originally said like a sloppy wet kiss, and my heart turns violently inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way that he loves us. So again, a lot of the way that these lyrics are talking about like your heart turning violently in your chest or love and beauty and touch and secrets and like there's not necessarily anything wrong with having some of those things attached to your sense of spirituality. But I think what makes it more toxic is that women are then told that that's also supposed to mirror your romantic relationships with other people. The last song lyrics that I want to talk about are from a song in 2009. And this is a perfect example of a song that is doing that like go after you and after you and after you type of thing that in real relationships is like stalkerish. In 2009, Jesus Culture came out with the song You Won't Relent. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. I'll set you as a seal upon my heart, as a seal upon my arms. For there is love that is as strong as death, jealousy demanding as the grave, and many waters cannot quench this love. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. So again, this is kind of falling into this possessive, intensely passionate idea of love, but in this case, a sacred love with God that then is supposed to mirror unearthly love, right? And here's the thing. If you are a teenager and you are told that God desires you, that is powerful, right? But it, it gets so messy and complicated when that gets bound up with romantic love and... <sighs> Yeah, I don't know. I'm in some ways I am still trying to disentangle my feelings on this, and I do now have a hard time with this hyper romantic personalized view of divinity and relationship with God, partly because of the issues that I see in the world and the fact that I think being able to feel like you have that kind of relationship often comes out of a place of serious privilege. Which takes us to the final part of this video, which is how some of these books end up propping up colonizer narratives, paternalism, and white supremacy. In Romancing God, Neil says that some people view evangelical romance reading as a childish act of an immature faith, one that escapes and denies the problems of real life through fictional plots that ensure happy endings. God embodies not so much an omnipotent ruler or a wrathful judge, but rather a gift-giving Santa Claus. 
From this vantage point, these women, unable to handle the tragedies of life even in fiction, retreat to a world of make-believe and feel-good emotions. As a result, readers deny the injustice and evil that characterize daily life and neglect to change the world in which they live. At this point, the sentimental choice becomes an immoral act. Proponents of this interpretation fear that the escapist impulses and sentimental endings of the genre foster a dangerous apathy in regard to the real world. Rather than change the circumstances of their lives, the situations that often lead to their escapist desires, these women do not seemingly recognize evil's power or challenge oppressive systems. Their reality becomes skewed, their anger minimal, and their actions minuscule. Neil does go on to push back on this a little bit. She says that while on the surface this does seem persuasive, there are some questions that remain, like what does it mean to term the religious practice of some women childish, which certainly is a problem? What is the task of the religious scholar? And why in the field of American religion have scholars sought to emphasize the agency of new religious movement members only to cast the shadow of passivity over female devotees of popular religion? These questions necessitate necessitate going deeper into the context, content, and consequences of these women's fictional devotion. So I think it's a little bit of a mixed bag that it's too simplistic to say that it's just childish, and we sometimes have the same things being thrown at readers of secular romances, but at the same time, I do think there is something to be said for the fact that these books ignore a lot of real problems in the outside world, or at least did at this time. Do they still? I don't know. Maybe some of them do and some of them don't. And I'm, I'm going to mention again the fact that we saw in part one, there is a big difference between white evangelical women reading the genre and black evangelical women reading the genre and the authors writing for each of those audiences. So from what I've taken away from this and from some of my own reading more recently, because a handful of inspirational romances that I will still read today, many of them are by black women who do deal more realistically with problems problems like racism and injustice in ways that this kind of book by white authors often don't, or at least didn't at the time. Um, but that does raise some interesting questions. Talking about some of the techniques that these authors use, though, of making it seem like God cares about mundane, minute details, which is certainly what I grew up thinking was the case, she says, if God is always there, then God is there for a reason. Authors seek to reassure readers that God has a plan for each person and that he cares about the details of their lives, from the smallest things like getting a parking space to the largest of things like healing. By focusing on God's attention to everyday details, as well as his presence and planning, authors hope that through their novels, readers will experience God. That said, Neil eventually goes on to say, many of the changes enacted by my consultants as a result of their reading occur through emotional and spiritual transformations on an individual level. At times, this pattern may result in a type of hyper-individualism that precludes one's ability or desire to assess situations on a macro-structural level or to gain another perspective on one's life. While these concerns are certainly merited, the individualistic tendency characterizes not only my consultants, but also evangelicalism as a whole. Now, she takes that as a reason not to push back on that hyper-individualism, but I would say, yes, she is correct. It is a problem within evangelicalism as a whole, and that is something that I take issue with, because it is so focused on the individual and not on the community, not on the world at large. And from my reading, that's also not biblical. That's not who Jesus was or what he did. And the Bible does often talk about things like structural oppression and enacts laws to help care for people affected by structural inequalities. So, you know, but in these books, the focus is either the individual or the family. And indeed, there is a big focus on family structures. Family has become a central metaphor for evangelical identity, whether through language of male headship, the practice of homeschooling, or endorsement of traditional gender roles, evangelicals see beliefs about family as a way to differentiate themselves from the world and to provide a heritage of faith for their children. Readers of the Love Comes Softly series, which we mentioned in video number one, gain an assurance of a parent's power to pass faith on to her children. The novels often show, as one reader described it, how the history of faith crosses generations, and women enjoy reading about these, quote, generations of faith, 
faithful parents raising faithful Christian children. For example, Nancy confided, I really like the storyline when you begin with the early years and continue on when the children grow and mature and as they go on their, to their own families and get children and grandchildren. She also expressed her enjoyment of reading about heroines who are strong Christian examples to their families, such as those who can influence their daughters. We need to talk about Christian historical romances because man are there a lot of problems with them and from what i understand this hasn't necessarily changed there are still major problems with many of the books getting published today they are books that tend to center the white colonial experience they are books that romanticize the past in ways that ignores the harms of colonization and they are often books that are very paternalistic and racist in their treatment of non-white people I do have some specific examples of this in the case studies we're going to look at, but first I want to take a look at what Neil has to say about these evangelical historical romances. While I situate evangelical romance novels in the social and cultural history of late 19th and 20th century evangelicalism, my consultants place evangelical romances within a larger religio-historical narrative. While some novels feature contemporary settings, many of the most popular titles set their heroines in the past. In these historical portrayals, the women I interviewed not only found solidarity with heroines and authors, but also discovered the sense of God's romancing, which we've already talked about. This sense emerged as they discerned not only the individual, but the historical nature of his providential planning. For those who are struggling to understand their historical role as evangelical women, these novels offer a glimpse into a past controlled by a loving, involved God. Whether or not evangelical romances accurately depict the past, while an interesting question, is not the point here. Some authors do extensive research, others do not, but the readers view the novels as historically accurate regardless. The number of women who talk in this book about enjoying reading historical romance novels because that's how they learn about history when often that history is inaccurate or heavily romanticized is very interesting. And, you know, this hasn't gone away. We're still seeing some of this romanticization of history. We're still seeing some of this changing of historical fact or lack of research to give a vibe. And that can end up being really harmful, especially because a lot of these are set in the American West in like the 1800s and deal very poorly with indigenous people, with black people. It's not great. It's worth noting that this is not just a problem in Christian romances. This is a problem in secular historical romances as well. And we are just starting to reckon with the way that history has often been whitewashed. It's been done in a heteronormative way. And I appreciate that we're finally starting to get queer authors and authors of color who are doing great research and writing great secular historical romance novels that give a better picture of the past. So while I'm talking here about Christian romance, this is a problem more broadly. The historical settings of the novels enable readers to imaginatively visit various locales, learn about historical events, and discover their place in history as women and as evangelicals. The novels depict a past where God and conservative Protestant women and men dominate. Just let that sink in for a moment. For my consultants, reading about evangelical heroines who influenced world history affirms their importance, and God's providential control. Consider, for example, representations of the, quote, Old West, the backdrop of many evangelical romances. For some readers, the lure of the 19th century trans-Mississippi West proves to be particularly strong. Women enjoy, quote, pioneer stories that portray the West as a promised land. For example, in both Sweetbriar and Love's Long Journey, the landscape of the West, in contrast with the civilized and crowded East, is depicted as a vast terrain that provides characters with a wide open space to house their dreams and hone their honor. Let's just ignore all of the indigenous people who already live on the land that is supposedly wide open for all of their dreams. Uh, yeah, we're, we're just gonna like ignore that and center as heroes white evangelical people. Awesome. Here's a great example. For Missy LaHaye, the heroine of Love's Long Journey, a flooded river becomes both an enemy and an ally. 
the river claims a fellow member of the wagon train, but at the same time, it separates pioneers from the threat of almost naked Indians. Missy shivered as she wondered what could have happened if the swollen river had not been between them. Maybe this was one fulfillment of God's promise, yea, I will help thee. The landscape may present obstacles, whether raging waters or Indian warriors, but God's promises enable these evangelical pioneers, these prairie women, to overcome them. While the heroes and heroines of the novels encounter troubles in the western terrain, with God's help, they ultimately triumph. The novel's happy endings assure readers of the characters' victories over adversity, their creation of Christian families, and their founding of a Christian America through their civilizing of the West. The historical narrative in these works is defined by God's romance with humanity as evidenced in his planning, power, and participation. Okay, so... <sighs> So there are a lot of obvious problems with this, but it creates this narrative of history that is very triumphalist, that like God helped white people colonize and commit genocide against indigenous people because they were the big bad and white people were the good guys and God protected them and helped them win. It had nothing to do with their advanced weaponry and disease and no, of course course not. It's interesting because right now for a book club thing, I'm reading an Indigenous People's History of the United States. This was the one for young people, so we're, we're reading the, the, the YA version of it. But, it, you know, it's read it. If you haven't read it, read it. Because this, this is covering the time periods that these heavily romanticized evangelical romances are tackling, the ones that are set in early America. And it's not good. It's it's really not good. And unfortunately, this hasn't gone away. The book that she quoted there came out in like the 90s, right? So you might think, well, it was the 90s, you know, like people, people were still really bad about that stuff in the 90s. But look, it, th this is this has not really gone away. Just a couple of years ago, we had a book win an award from the Romance Writers of America, the RWA, that continued to perpetuate these harmful ideas about American history, and it was in the inspirational romance category. This was the book, At Love's Command by Karen Wittemeyer. The hero had committed genocide against indigenous people, and that wasn't really pushed back on. In fact, the entire series is going to be following him and his buddies from the American military who were involved in the genocide of indigenous men, women, and children. And he's our romantic hero. And this was just published a couple of years ago and won an award in inspirational Christian fiction. So this wasn't just a problem of the 90s. This is still a problem today. And it's really harmful, but I think indicative of all the things we talked about in the first video in this series, where we did talk about the fact that so much of American evangelical Christianity is steeped in racism and white supremacy. Again, see part one of this video for that. Not everybody, but it, it is a real systemic issue. So we've seen a couple of examples of the Western American context where things are done really badly. Let's take a look at a couple of case studies of books that handle race and colonization poorly in a global context. First up, we have Silk by Linda Chaikin. This is the first book of a trilogy. Our main character is a beautiful blonde woman who is born in British colonial India. And this is very much a white savior narrative. She adopts an Indian boy. It's also, of course, because it's a Christian novel, very much about conversion. And so the villains of the story are not Christians. They follow various religious practices indigenous to India. And 
there, there's that. So we can talk about the problems with international adoption, especially by Christian communities where it maybe isn't always done very well. We can talk about paternalism. We can talk about propping up colonizer narratives where the white person is the hero in this story. All of that is definitely there. Similarly, we could take a look at the very popular Hawk and the Jewel by Laurie Wick. This is a historical romance set in England. And our heroine is a blonde, violet-eyed girl. Like, who has violet eyes? Why was this a thing? I don't really understand it. Do, do, does anyone actually have purple eyes? Like, is that a thing? I don't understand. Anyway, it's weird. But uh, blonde hair, violet eyes, and this this has a lot of problems with it, y'all. This is also a great example of where there's grooming in some of these books. This one has grooming in it, and it's creepy going back and rereading it as an adult. Like, why did I love this so much? But our main character was kidnapped as a baby by the ruler of this uncivilized nation that is clearly supposed to be a stand-in for a, a, like a Muslim country. And like, they're bad and evil because they're not Christians. And our heroine, of course, is a heathen. And so her whole transformation is to go from rebellious heathen to sweet, submissive Christian girl. That's like her character arc. But the thing is, is that when she's rescued, she's like 11 years old. And the man who rescues her is like 20. And he's gonna end up being the hero of our book. And it's super weird. It's super freaking weird. So we see this like almost grooming type behavior for her as she gets older and technically nothing happens until she's like 16. <laughs> but she's 16. <sighs> and like, did people get married at 16 back then? Sure. Like, is it okay for someone like me, a teenage girl, to be reading a book where there's like grooming happening by a much older man that's being romanticized? Not to mention all of the like fetishizing colonial things. But like, no, it's not okay. It's really bad and really unhealthy. I do want to note the fact that the problems I'm talking about primarily are coming from books written by white authors. Romances in this space written by black authors often are quite different. And I've even read a few more modern ones by people like Piper Hughley, who do a great job of integrating elements of faith into their books while also dealing realistically with the world around them and having people who feel like actual people that don't fetishize the past in these really unhealthy ways, that don't have a hero that feels like they're supposed to be a stand-in for Jesus. Like there are authors writing somewhat religious romances that I think are doing a good job with it. But then there's the Karen Wittemeyers of the world, right? <laughs> so clearly this is still a problem. For me, a lot of it is unpacking what were the things that I took away from all of this intensive reading I did as a young person during very formative years as a young teenager and having to grapple with how harmful a lot of those things were. So it's complicated. Personally, I don't know yet quite how to disentangle my sense of the divine from this hyper individualized kind of approach. That's something I'm actively working on and thinking about. Like, can I have a sense of spirituality that dovetails with my actual beliefs of what the world is and what kind of faith I might have. I don't know. I'm still working through that. And I know that for some people that just isn't possible. Other people find a way to that. And I think that that's great also. But what we have here represented in some of these books is this hyper individualized romanticized form of spirituality that is situated within patriarchal often misogynistic structures and that is a problem and of course all of this does intersect with purity culture which is going to be what our next video is about. So I will be reading a couple of books for my discussion of purity culture. That video will be coming at some point in the future. I, I am going to say this because I know people have been loving the series and really excited to see more and more of them from me. I'm glad I'm doing this video series, but also I guess just know that like there is a lot of emotional labor that goes into researching, outlining, and producing these videos. Like, thank goodness I have a therapy session later this week. 
because I feel like I have things I need to talk about. But, you know, it's been cathartic for me. It's been a positive thing, but I, I may need a little bit of a break before I get to the next video in the series. But I hope that this was helpful, informative, and I would love to hear from you in the comments down below. Let me know your thoughts. I've loved hearing from a lot of you. And I don't know where we go from here. I don't know how we come up with an ethic of spirituality that is more helpful and positive. And I don't fault people who continue to enjoy some of these books because I loved them for a long time. I They just like they don't sit well with me any longer. But I think we do need to grapple with the reality of what's contained within these books. And I am really curious to know what the movie version of Redeeming Love did with the source material. I don't feel like it's going to be great but maybe it's better. If you've seen it, you can let me know in the comments down below. And if people are really interested, maybe I'll try to do like a side by side comparison. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see how I'm feeling, but it, it might be interesting to look at. But talk to me in the comments down below. If you guys like this video, it does help if you give it a thumbs up. And if you want to be notified whenever the next video comes out, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time.